Michael Avenatti. We've talked about him for some time here on the channel. Well, if for a while here, he was America's savior. He was going to just protect us all from Donald Trump, who, of course, was the megalomaniacal maniac out there who was going to just wreck everything for everybody. And so Avenatti was sentenced today. Here's a picture of him walking into court. He arrives for a scheduled sentencing hearing over at the Manhattan Federal Court. He's still masked up. He's a California lawyer who publicly sparred with then President Donald Trump before the criminal fraud charges. Today, he was in court and he was sentenced. And so now he's going to be going to prison for two and a half years, which is actually quite a light sentence. And so we're going to go through this today. I want to explain what happened here. I'm a criminal defense attorney. Okay, I don't like it instinctually when somebody goes to prison. It is it is a horrendous thing that often happens. Okay, Michael Avenatti is a special kind of of bad person. No question about it. We're going to get into that. But I just want to you know re remind ourselves that when this when this happens, basically everybody breaks. Okay, you 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 sort of. I've watched this happen. I've watched grown men with big companies just sort of crumble. When you're in front of a judge and you're getting sentenced, it's a big deal, right? Everything changes. Your ego just sort of strips away from you and it's a it's a it's a it's it's a humbling almost sacred symbolic experience. Okay, you're taking somebody, and I mean sacred not in a good way, but you know in a, in a it's a it's a powerful thing that happens. Somebody who was once free is now going into custody. Okay, it's a big deal. And so we just want to pause and have a little bit of humanity for that. Now, you know, you can have a lot of disdain for Michael Avenatti. I don't find him to be somebody who is an esteemable, esteemable person. And we're going to talk about that. And I also have a little bit of a, an increased lack of empathy for him, largely because of the fact that he's an attorney. Right. And people hold attorneys in a little bit higher regard and attorneys have a little bit of an unfair advantage. We have some extra training, some schooling, some years in court. And so when you are engaging with non lawyers as a lawyer, it's kind of like especially when you're talking about legal issues, it's kind of like, you know, uh, wrestling with your younger brother, somebody who's younger than you that you can easily be, you can easily take advantage of if you know that. And so you, you can't do that, right? You, you sort of have to hold yourself to a higher standard to make sure that that doesn't happen. This is the same reason why I get so irritated when cops do bad things because it's like, hey, we give you total power, a total monopoly to do whatever you want. You got a badge and a gun. You went through special training. You've got a total, you know, you got all the money in the world. You have a ton of, of backup anywhere you want. And so you've got special privileges that other people don't. So when you breach the law, when you violate the same law that you were sworn to uphold, I got a huge problem with that. It is sort of a somebody in a position of power dumping all over somebody that doesn't. I don't like bullies and I don't like being in a situation where, you know, people are taking advantage of other people. It drives me bananas. That's why I'm a defense attorney because our US government, our federal state governments do that all day long every day. But Michael Avenatti did it as well. So he has a special level of disdain coming from me. So I, I don't I don't appreciate you know anything that he's done. I don't appreciate his political uh, perspectives or the spectacle that we saw from him. I also don't like you know how the media treated him. But there also is a little bit of humanity left when somebody goes to prison for two and a half years. When somebody goes into custody, it's a thing that happens and people will break. So we got to have a little bit of humanity there as we go through this. Now, that being said, there's a brilliant philosopher who once said, true happiness is seeing your neighbor fall off their roof. Michael Avenatti just fell off the roof. And a lot of people in the media also fell off the roof. Remember this one? He's Donald Trump's worst nightmare, Michael <laughs> Avenatti. Joining us once again is Michael Avenatti. Let's bring in Michael Avenatti. Michael Avenatti. Michael Avenatti. Michael Avenatti, thank you very much. He's out there saving the <laughs> Look, country. Don Meacham says he may be the savior of the republic. You are something of a folk hero now. I owe Michael Avenatti an apology. I've been saying enough for writing, Michael. I've seen you everywhere. What do you have left to say? I was wrong, brother. You have a lot to say. I uh, am just dying to hear what you think. These people all like you. I'm the only person right here Donald Trump fears more than Robert Miller. We think you guys are the tip of the spear that's going to take down Donald Trump. Right. Michael, Michael all right, so is a beast. Yep. We're going we're gonna to continue on with this clip, but I forgot to mention 
Listen to the very last couple seconds of this clip. I've played this clip before, but not in its entirety. We're gonna pause, just listen to the last thing that he says. So we're gonna go through the clip, he's gonna finish, and then we're gonna see this splash frame. I think it's from Free Beacon. And then there's one final clip from Mr. Avenatti. Let's listen, see what that is. Okay, that's true. And he, he's a beast. He's a beast. I hand it to yeah. her, and I hand it to Michael Avenatti. But he has a great, bigger calling here. That being a lawyer is minimal compared to what he's doing. No one has talked tougher directly to Donald Trump on TV than Michael Avenatti. And Donald Trump is afraid to mention his name. That's fascinating. Donald Trump is terrified of Michael Avenatti. Yeah. Yeah. Does Trump will run for his money more than anybody <laughs> else, Michael Avenatti? An existential threat to the Trump presidency. The Democrats could learn something for you. You are messing with Trump a lot more than they are. He has no doubt created sheer panic in Donald Trump's very fragile mind. Michael Avenatti is laying down the law as mm. guest co-host. And is he really thinking about running for president? Uh, one reason why I'm taking you seriously as a contender is because of your presence on cable news. You look at the field of Democrats right now and Avenatti's the one who stands out. If they decide they value a fighter most, yes. people would be foolish to underestimate Michael yeah. Avenatti. I have always said that they need a fighter. Look, I mean, we're going to continue to use the media. I think we've used it with great success. Wait for it. Here it comes. Here it comes. All of my sexual fantasies involve handcuffs. Oh. oh. Well, Mr. Avenatti, well, unfortunately, uh, you're going to get to experience those. You did today, in fact, two and a half years in prison for extortion, according to the AP. So Michael Avenatti, the brash California lawyer who represented Stormy Daniels in the lawsuit against President Trump, sentenced two and a half years for trying to extort $25 million dollars from Nike by threatening them with bad publicity. So he's 50 years old, convicted last year uh, of charges, including attempted extortion and honest of honest services based on a representation of an LA youth basketball league who was upset that Nike had ended its league sponsorship. So, so in LA youth basketball, they're mad. They go to uh, Avenatti. He calls Nike and then tries to extort them. U.S. District Judge Paul G. Gardefi called Avenatti's conduct outrageous, saying, quote, he hijacked his client's claims and used those claims to further his own agenda, which was to extort millions of dollars from Nike for himself. And so in federal court during the sentencing proceeding, you really, you can't have audio or video, so we can't, you know, check in on any of this stuff. But the, I did poke around Twitter and some people were doing the live tweeting thing. So we're going to poke around and just want to show you some of the things that I saw. Here is Jerry Dunleavy. Okay. Now he is over there saying that Michael Avenatti is crying in the courtroom during his speech before sentencing. Right. He says that. And so, of course, that that caught a lot of attention and a lot of journalists were were listening to that. And they go, oh, my gosh, he's He's bawling his eyes out in there. What the heck's going on? So, you know, that was spreading around and a lot of people are saying, oh, well, Mr. Tough Guy, huh? Okay, yeah, how about that there? Not so fun, is it? You know, and so I understand wanting to spike the football. I get it. I know it's fun and, it's, oh, yeah, you know, kind of feels good from time to time. But as I said, this is a big thing, right? He's going to prison for two and a half years and you might think that's well warranted. Maybe you do. Maybe it is. That doesn't take away from the importance of what happened. It's a, it's a big thing when that happens to anybody, and we don't want to sort of skate over that. All right, so Jerry Dunleavy says, the judge is now calmly reading Avenatti's F-word laden Nike extortion rants. These were secretly recorded by the FBI into the record before sentencing. So what does that mean? <laughs> the judge, the judge was sort of skewering him a little bit. You know, the knife's kind of in there and he's kind of twisting it a little bit. So Avenatti comes up there and he's like, judge, uh, bawling his eyes out. I'm sorry. And we're going to hear some of what he said. And then the judge says, huh? Okay. Well, how about this? Pulls out the transcript and just says, oh, Avenatti said, uh, give me the effing, 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 effing this. Okay. Now next line, judge effing, you know, all, all and on and on. So Avenatti's sitting there going, yeah, I said that. Yep, said that too. Yep, said that too. And so after his sentencing, where he's, you know, probably doing this whole, you know, I'm really sorry routine, then the judge comes back out and says, well, why'd you do that then? That doesn't make any sense. And so when that happens, you would tend to think that the judge would be coming down with a very harsh sentence. They're going to just say, well, I don't like this. And so we're going to make sure this slams hard. We'll see if the judge did that. In fact, now, as I mentioned, Cernovich was out there and he got this right. He says, listen, 
take no joy in Avenatti's breakdown in court. Rejoicing in suffering is how demons enter you. Avenatti was an evil man pr promoted by every major corporate media outlet. They collaborated with and they promoted disinformation. God is evening the ledger. <sighs> There's a reason people follow Cernovich. That's a powerful tweet right there. And I think he's, he's, he's right, right? Avenatti, we've seen the media do this. They just sort of use people. They're disposable. They just bring them up. Oh, Avenatti, he's got a loud mouth and he's very aggressive. And we like what he says. We like his style. So they put him on every single show, just like I played in that montage earlier, where they're just milking this for everything. And you see them do this all over, all over the place, right? It's the same routine. Avenatti's not useful to them anymore. Just right in the garbage. Gone. Right. And this happens, my friends, with a lot of the stories we talk about here it happens with Breonna Taylor. It just happened with George Floyd. OK, he, Chauvin was convicted, all of that stuff. Right. Is there going to be any changes? Not that I've seen. We've seen the George Floyd bill still just getting kicked around over there and uh, nothing's going to happen. Joe Biden set a deadline. I think it was May 25th. Gone and gone. Came and came and went. Gone. So everybody just jumps on it. Right. And regardless of what you think about George Floyd, there are a lot of people talking about that case and saying specifically that, oh, this is going to be the impetus for change. We're all going to defund the police and do all of this stuff. And then now we're just we're seeing, well, there's a crime wave. And in fact, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, the two biggest law enforcement advocates in the history of the country are out there saying, well, we got an extra three hundred and fifty billion dollars now for uh, local law enforcement. So George Floyd was just a convenient name, somebody that did, didn't really matter much at all. It was just useful for the time. It was very useful during the election season. Got a lot of people riled up and all vitriolic and amped up to go out there and vote against an evil racist warmonger named Donald Trump. And now they can suddenly uh, uh, kind of do the same thing here with Avenatti. Oh, well, he, he, was, he was useful until he wasn't anymore, right in the garbage, which is just, it's reprehensible that they do that to people. Uh, you, you'd imagine that there would be a, a little bit more, I, I would say, I guess, I guess integrity, right? If, if you believe in something, if you're going to get on the internet and get on news and get on media all the time and sort of, you know, advocate for something, Michael Avenatti is the best in the world. We heard that from everybody. And now he's like, oh, whoop, whoop. Sorry about that. So uh, anyways, so uh, Cernovich is out here. Yeah, Avenatti's, you know, a piece of garbage. But at the same time, if you sort of really take pleasure in somebody else's suffering or their downfall, what does that do? It just sort of invites that in into your heart. And so we try to, you know, have humanity, especially when you're at the end of the line. Okay, Avenatti's at the end of the line. It's over for him. So at this moment, spike in the football might feel good, but it really... I don't know how necessary it is. Okay, let's go back to the article. Avenatti said that the judge added that he had become drunk on the power of his platform, which is true, which the media gave him and they exploited it, or what he perceived the power of his platform to be, right? Not so powerful. He had be become someone who operated as if the laws and the rules that applied to everyone else didn't apply to him. Criminal fraud charges on two coasts disrupted Avenatti's rapid ascent to fame. He faces the start of a fraud trial next week in Los Angeles, which we're going to look at here shortly. This is a second California criminal trial. Uh, there was another one in California later this year and a separate trial next year in Manhattan, where he's charged with cheating Daniels out of hundreds of thousands of dollars. So when I say he's at the end of the line, I, I mean, I meant that, right? He's not just done. This happened in New York. He's going back to California, criminal trial next week, going back out next year for uh, another one in California, then back out next year to another one in Manhattan. So they're just going to keep stacking these charges on top of him. He has become no longer useful. And so he is now expendable. So Avenatti then is a, represented, as we all know, Stormy Daniels in 2018, lawsuits against Donald Trump. He explored running against Trump in 2020, boasting that he would have no problem raising money. Daniels said that a tryst with Trump, we remember all of that, the political aspirations evaporated when prosecutors in California and New York charged Avenatti with fraud. March 2019, California prosecutors said he was enjoying a $200,000 a month lifestyle, a month, my friends, a month while cheating clients out of millions of dollars and failing to pay hundreds of thousands to the IRS. So uh, all of those are very disgusting things. Cheating his own clients out of millions of dollars while living on a $200,000 a month lifestyle. That's a lot of money every month. Wow. So yeah, that's a lot. Wow. What do you get for that? Anyways, okay, I was going to make a Stormy Daniels comment on that, but I'm going to 
going to hold myself back on that one. Okay, so what else happened in court today? Of course, here's Dev Devlin Barrett, who is a Washington Post reporter. He covers the FBI DOJ. He was there listening in. He said, look, uh, the, the judge... Uh, here's what Avenatti said. So, of course, we can't get recordings of this, but this is what he says that Avenatti said. He said, TV and Twitter, Your Honor, mean nothing. He said, Avenatti is crying, thanking his family for standing by him. He says, quote, I and I alone have destroyed my career, my relationships, my life, and there is no doubt that I deserve to pay, have paid, and will pay a further price for what I have done. Okay, so, look. At a moment like that, I take him for his word on that. I know, I know many people probably don't agree with that, but at that moment, it's the end of the line. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt on that one. The judge has already said he calculates the sentencing guidelines for Avenatti at somewhere between nine and 11 years. Okay, so keep a pin in that one, nine and 11 years. The judge is now recounting the factual history of the Nike shakedown. Usually not a great sign for a defendant when the judge keeps quoting him saying, I'm not effing around in quotes, right? He keeps saying it over and over. I'm not effing around. Give me the money. I'm not effing around Nike. I'm not effing around. We'll do it. Judges kept saying it over and over again. The judge said, Mr. Avenatti's conduct was outrageous, hijacked his clients. We already read that one. Mr. Avenatti said he became drunk with power. So the rules didn't apply to him. The judge hammers the lawyer, Mark Garagos, and implicitly rebukes the Justice Department for not charging him a different lawyer. The judge says, why didn't Mark Garagos get charged? Garagos, the judge said, suffered no consequences as a result of his conduct, and he was a central figure in the criminal conduct, right? Right? So the question then becomes, right, is this a political prosecution? Why is Avenatti getting prosecuted, but not Mark Garagos? Judge wants to know. I think it's a good question, right? I don't support political prosecutions either way. Avenatti, not a good, not a good man at all. A terrible lawyer does damage to the to the reputation of the entire industry. And any lawyer that does that should be reprimanded and scolded and run right out of the, the profession, in my opinion. And still does not deserve a political prosecution. Because I keep saying this. When that happens, the pendulum swings the other way. If you're going to be doing cartwheels because Avenatti got politically prosecuted, well, they're doing it right now to all the Capitol Hill defendants, and the pendulum swings the other way, as we say here. Wow, says Devlin Barrett. He says the judge drastically departs downwardly and gives Avenatti three years in prison on this case, saying it's not justice for Mr. Avenatti to be sentenced to 9 to 11 years when Mr. Garagos was not even charged. Huh. So the judge is saying your compatriot over there didn't get charged. So I can't give you nine to 11 when he gets zero. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reduce yours down to two and a half down from nine years. So maybe you might say, well, maybe if this is a political prosecution, he got kind of a hell of a deal, didn't he? Nine years down to, or up to 11 down to two and a half. That's a smoking deal. I wonder if some of the Capitol Hill people would get that same benefit in a situation like this? Or what if would a Trumper get the same benefit? Okay, we know Michael Flynn sat in custody for a long time. Devlin Barrett, a potential nine-year prison sentence for Avenatti was reduced to 2.5, the kind of sentencing break usually reserved for those who flip and provide evidence. The judge was greatly displeased that Garagos walked away from the case scot-free. Big, big departure, major break. And there's another attorney here on Twitter who also is sort of concurring with that. Adriana Lawrence says prosecutors asked the court to give Avenatti eight years or nine to 11. So a sentence of 30 months is rather light handed, particularly given that he's an attorney and was convicted of extortion, wire fraud and a related offense. And so the reason I clipped that right is to just hammer that point home. If you're an attorney, if you're somebody in a position of power, you take a, an extra oath to get sworn in. And you've got a big problem if you commit a crime that is a dishonest crime. It is something that is looked upon more disfavorably because now we're questioning your morality, right? If you are somebody that gets a DUI, you're a lawyer, you get a DUI, okay, well, maybe you're an alcoholic, right? Maybe you're somebody that just has an addiction problem. Maybe this was just a mistake. But if you're actually extorting somebody and you're wire frauding stuff and you're trying to sort of, in a dishonest manner, take things from other people, that's a crime of, of, of uh, uh, dishonesty, which is very problematic because people need to trust you because you're a lawyer. You have, you have outsized 
power over their estates, for example, or the, their, the custody of their kids, or in our case, their freedoms, whether they go to prison or not. So if they entrust us with that, it is a sacred thing that we have to protect to the end of the earth. And, and Michael Avenatti didn't. People trusted him and he just extorted them and committed wire fraud. So, uh, you know, three years for that, it does feel light. Now, to be fair, Adriana Lawrence says, well, but his legal issues are far from over. He still faced a host of tax and bank charges in California. Trial set to begin next week in federal court. And next year, Avenatti returns to New York for another federal trial on charges that he embezzled money from Stormy Daniels. Right. So this guy is going to be bounced around the system for some period of time. And, you know, he's he's not somebody undeserving of that. So I want to show you quickly. We've got three more slides in this segment from uh, the case against Michael Avenatti that is still taking place in California. So, you know, uh, he, he's presumably getting ready to pack up and head over here because trial starts on July 13th. Unless there's any additional continuances, Avenatti is scheduled for trial, like literally next week. So let's take a look at the government's trial memorandum. I want to show you this fairly briefly. This was filed July 7th, 25 pages. We're not going to go through the entirety of it. This is the government's trial memorandum. Okay, so it's a memorandum on counts 1 to 10, they're noting here that the trial starts July 13th, 8 a.m., courtroom of James Selna, Honorable James Selna, United States versus Michael John Avenatti in the Central District of California. So this is taking place over there. And what they're saying is they're, they're giving us a trial memorandum. And a, and a memo is just sort of an, uh, that's a memo, right? It's a memorandum. It is a, a sort of a briefing about what's taking place in the trial. The judge doesn't really know what's going on. The judge says, okay, prosecutors, I need you to tell us about what happened here. What are the facts? What do you intend to prove? Do you have any problems that we need to address? Did they not disclose anything? Are you missing anything? Who are your witnesses? How much time do you need? Who you call in and who you might call in? Whatever. All the mechanics, all the technicalities. We spent a lot of time on this channel talking about that during the Derek Chauvin trial. All the motions in limine. What can the officer say and not say? And so kind of the list goes on and on. Now, the, the government in this memo is saying, here, judge, this is what we've got for you. And let's take a look at the table of contents and see what's inside. So they tell us first and foremost, we got an introduction, which we just saw. They define the embezzlement counts. And then we'll note that they have a statement of facts for four different victims. We have Michelle Fon, we have Gregory Barella, we have Alexis Gardner, and we have Jeffrey Johnson. So they're saying that not only did he embezzle funds, he did it from four people. Okay, four different times, four different occasions. They go through the elements of the offense. They go through the legal and evidentiary issues. So they talk about whether there were you know, admissions made that were authorized or uh, made by agencies, whether the government has identified for the defense business, business records that it intends to introduce at trial. So this is an evidentiary issue. Can this business record ever come into court? Right? They might argue over that. Cross-examination of the defendant. Is Michael Avenatti going to be testifying or is he going to be cross subject to cross-examination? Are they going to redact anything from any of the trial exhibits so that it doesn't become part of uh, what the jury sees? Are they going to be impeaching anybody? Uh, how about the, the defendant's other fraud charges? The government wants to address that. They also want to address the lack of reciprocal discovery or affirmative defenses, saying that, hey, you know, we're, we're the government. We gave Avenatti and his team a lot of information, but they're not reciprocating. They're not giving that data back to us. And then other privilege issues that the defendant may attempt to raise, of course, you know, like, like the right against self-incrimination and things like that. Maybe they're going to want to address that. So it's a 25 page memo and they go through and they just sort of lay all of that out there. We're not going to go through the entirety for the sake of time. But of course, I want to show you just a, a, a snippet from the introduction and then the statement of facts so you can see what kind of conduct they're alleging occurred here. The memorandum of points and authorities, we have the introduction. So the jury trial on the severed client embezzlement counts, which means that they're just going forward on just the embezzlement counts. So there must be other charges. It starts July 13th. Jury selection begins at 8 a.m. Opening statements followed by the government's case in chief are going to begin on July 20th at 830. The government says they need three weeks for its case, including jury selection. The government is going to call 30 witnesses. The defendant is currently on temporary release pending trial, but probably not anymore. Probably now in custody because he has been sentenced and uh, they take you into custody at that time. So now let's take a look at the facts. Trials coming up. Jury selection is going to start. Oh, uh, the case in chief starts July 20th. 
So maybe we'll continue to follow this. We'll see what is going on in the case though. Let's see what's happening here. So the statement of facts, the evidence at trial will prove the following according to the government. This is what we're gonna show they say. Between January, 15, January 2015 and March 2019, so about four years, defendant was licensed in California. He defrauded five people. We talked about them. Jeffrey, Alexis, Gregory, Michelle, Long. And he stole almost $10 million in settlement funds that belonged to them. How did he do it? Well, it was pretty simple. First, he would negotiate on behalf of a client a settlement that would require the payment of the funds to the client. Then he would misrepresent, conceal, falsely describe to the client the true terms of the settlement or the disposition of the proceeds. Next, he would cause the proceeds to be deposited into a bank account that the defendant controlled. He would then embezzle and misappropriate the proceeds to which he was not entitled. Then he would lull the client to prevent the client from discovering his embezzlement and misappropriation by other things, falsely denying that the settlement proceeds had been paid, sending funds to the client under the false pretense that such funds were advances on the purportedly yet to be received settlement proceeds, and then falsely claimed that a payment of the settlement proceeds had been delayed for legitimate reasons and would occur at a later time. Oh my goodness, this guy is just the worst. So what he's doing is, <laughs> let's say he, rep he sues somebody, okay? So he's a Stormy Daniels attorney, right? He represents her and he sues Donald Trump and they settle the case. I think Trump paid $150,000 to settle that claim. So he didn't do this with Stormy, but he did it with four other people in California. So he goes and he's negotiating with the Trump organization. Okay, well, we're going to settle it. Well, we want a quarter million. Nope, we'll give you 75. They settle on 150. So then Avenatti goes back to his client and says, great news. We got a, an amazing settlement. You're going to be getting $100,000. The client goes, well, that's great. You think that's as good as we can do? Well, you know, I, I've been working hard. They wanted to give us 75, but I bumped it up to 100. And so now I think we're good. We should take this deal. Client goes, that's great. You're a great lawyer. Uh, Brian Stelter loves you. Wow, this is amazing. And then Avenatti slowly, you know, through this uh, d disbursement and advancing and all of that stuff is sort of irrelevant. He's sending money over there and, you know, they start cashing these checks and then they start poking around and saying, yeah, but, uh, huh. I, I, it, I, I, it might, might be us, but I think you settled that for 150,000 and you only gave us a hundred. So what happened to the remaining 50, huh? And Avenatti said, well, no. And he's moving money around and advancing them some other things. And we didn't get it yet. And we didn't do this and all this stuff. Meanwhile, he's living on a $200,000 a month lifestyle. Where's that money going? Somebody found out about it. And now he is getting, uh, charged with new crimes in California. Probably going to be convicted on those as well. Not a good thing. I know a lot of attorneys that are very, very sloppy with their money and they sort, you know, it's not good and it's very dishonest. And so that should be addressed as it will be. Okay, great stuff. Let's take a look at over over at the uh, chat at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. Let's see if we've got any questions in the house. We got a good one here from Jack Alaya says, uh, Robert, Everyone is, cap is, take is capable of taking advantage of their specialization to extort or swindle someone else. In my opinion, if a jury of peers is possible, then the sentencing for all persons must be equal without regard to occupation, race, sex, color, ethnicity, religion, disability, veteran status, or we are not a nation of peers. We are a caste nation where status may be legislated into segregated treatment under the law by category. Yeah, very interesting question. So, you know, this is a... This is a very good debate, Jack Alaya, and I think that this is an astute point that you're making, right? This is something that we've been talking about in criminal law for all for for forever, essentially. Do you standardize justice or do you make it responsive to the defendant in front of you? There are pros and cons of both. If you make it standardized, then everybody gets the same penalty. The problem with that is that there are oftentimes I would say most of the time, exceptions to the rule, okay? And, and quite frankly, our legislature, uh, legislators, the people who write the criminal laws are morons, actually. So they don't really know what they're doing. And they will write these laws in different ways that have all these exceptions and all sorts of things. And so we get clients and they come in and they say, well, the mandatory sentence is this. And we say, I know it is, but that's not appropriate. And here's why. Mother, two kids, going to be deported or whatever, right? The whole thing 
turns into a big thing. And and if you did impose that mandatory sentence that is equal to everybody, it really would not feel just for that one person. And believe me when I tell you this, this is very common. And we have a lot of lunatic uh, elected officials out there that the only thing they want to do every year is just make the criminal law harsher. That's it. That's the only thing. Tough on crime. I'm a sheriff, whatever. And that's the only thing that they do. And so if you have just sort of a, a an equal penalty across the board, no matter what, then you're going to get a lot of people overly punished that probably shouldn't be. The opposite of that, of course, on the other end of the spectrum is that you don't have mandatory sentencing. You don't have these three strikes rules. You don't have what Joe Biden did where if you get a first offense crack cocaine violation, it's five years prison, right? You get, that's what happens when that happens. I don't care what color you are. I don't care. Crack's a problem. Five years. Everybody goes, yeah, great. Violence. We don't like drug violence. Okay. And so now you've got You know, a lot of people whose lives are ruined over that thing. And that's mandatory sentencing. Everybody gets that. So it can be a big problem. On the other side, though, then you have sort of a responsive type of sentencing where every defendant comes through. You you ideally want to say, well, we're going to give this person a fair shake. Rob Gruler's here. And here's what he's being charged with. And here's what he does. And here's why maybe we should work the penalty down. And the government comes and says, maybe this is why we should work the penalty up. And we're going to make it responsive to the unique individual. Well, what does that mean? Well, that opens up a lot of room for variables to come into play and and some subjective interpretation of the events. And so one judge might look at me sitting there as a defendant, oh, please show me mercy, saying, you're right. I appreciate you, Rob. I appreciate this and I appreciate this. And thank you. You've shown yourself to be remorseful and we're going to give you a low penalty. And another judge might say, oh, no, that's you're, you're the worst. And what I saw from you and what I heard from you doesn't resonate with me. And therefore, I'm going to give you the maximum penalty. And if you take that same sort of dichotomy now, and then you introduce a racial element to that, then it becomes a huge problem. And legitimately, right? Now, if you have, and this has historically happened in this country, where you'll have a certain racial demographic that gets a more severe penalty than another racial demographic. And so that causes everybody to start to say, oh, well, we need mandatory penalties then from everybody across the board. And so that's where we're at now. We've got the three strikes. We've got mandatory minimums. We've got Joe Biden's you know, crime bill from 1994 that is still sort of enmeshed throughout our entire country. And people are having this debate left and right. It's a great question. I don't know that we're going to get an answer to it because there are there are problems with both both approaches. Great question, though. Let's see what else we have here. We've got a couple other ones. Azizi's in the house. Joe Snow's here. We've got Jack Elias here. Let's see if we've got any other questions. Oh, that one Florida man is here. Good to see you. That one Florida man says, everyone should check out a YouTube of Joe Rogan and Alex Jones. Out of context edits are hilarious. So that's funny. Um, so Joe Rogan, I just saw was over on. Oh, no, I just read an article that the Spotify people are very angry with Joe Rogan. Norovirus here says, hmm, Jack Elia says, no mercy for Robert. He will be face palmed with a cream pie. Looking forward to that. That's going to be fun. We have Be Brave says it stops. Okay, so great questions. All of those over from watching the watchers dot locals dot com. Looking forward to that cream pie, cream, cream pie, Jack Elia. That's going to be fun. Now, if you hit somebody in the face with a cream pie, and they don't want to be hit in the face with a cream by, that is probably going to be an assault charge. And so if you happen to know somebody like Jack Elia, who is cream pieing people in the face, well, uh, you might need some criminal representation. Our law firm, the R&R Law Group, can help with that. Our mission is to provide safety, clarity, and hope to good people facing criminal charges, including the pie throwers. We have a free consultation that is available, and our phone number is 480-787-0394, also online, rrlawaz.com. You can take a picture of this QR code, and it's going to take you right over to the website where you can schedule online. We have an awesome team of people. We look forward to helping you with any type of criminal charge that you're facing in the state of Arizona, things like DUIs, drug offenses, misdemeanor, traffic violations, and everything and anything in between. If you don't need any help, I'd invite you to go check out some of my offerings over at gumroad.com slash Robert Gruler. In particular, the law enforcement interaction training, which is available now, $19, and it's two and a half hours. It gives you the one, two, three rule for dealing with law enforcement. It's the one rule you need. It's the two questions that you have to answer, and it's three powerful responses, kind of like a one-two combo that you can send back out towards their way verbally. It's verbal judo, not uh, physical. That might help you uh, escape criminal liability when the government is trying to make you a criminal. So check that out at gumroad.com slash Robert Gruler. All right.